Hello everyone, I am Andrea and I'll be your MC for today. Thank you for joining us in today's dialogue on European perspectives on China's rise and US-China rivalry. This forum is organized by West Scientific Publishing. Now moving to the next slide, there's a few housekeeping notes before we start. You are most welcome to leave your cameras on, but please keep the mics muted while the forum is ongoing. There will be a Q&A session after the talk, so please feel free to post your questions in the chat at any time. After posting your questions in, in the chat, you may be invited to unmute and read it out during the Q&A session if you are comfortable doing so. Also, this webinar will be recorded and posted online. Now, moving to the next slide. Today, we are honored to welcome Professor Kerry Brown as our special guest. Professor Brown recently published his book, China Through European Eyes with Wire Scientific. Today's forum is sequel to the book's contents, covering how Europeans view and respect and respond to China's rise in China-US rivalry today. He is currently Professor of Chinese Studies and Director of the Lao China Institute at King's College London. He is an adjunct of the Australia New Zealand School of Government in Melbourne and the co-editor of the Journal of Current Chinese Affairs, run from the German Institute for Global Affairs in Hamburg. He is an affiliate of the Mongolia and Inner Asia Studies Unit at Cambridge University. We also have three co-moderators joining the discussion with Professor Brown today and answering your questions during the Q&A segment. Uh, moving to the next slide. The first is Professor Dashong Feng, Honorary Dean of Hainan University Belt and Road Research Institute and Chief Advisor of the China Silk Road E-Valley Research Institute. And then to the next slide, our next co-moderator is Professor Jichun Ju, Professor and Chair of the International Relations Department at Bucknell University, USA. He is also a member of the National Committee on United States-China Relations. And in, in the next slide, um, joining us as well as a co-moderator is Professor Stephen Pei, Professor of Physics and Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Houston, Deputy Director at the Center for Advanced Materials and Executive Director at the Southwest Public Safety Technology Center. Now, without further ado, let us welcome Professor Brown to kick off the discussion. Great, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here today. And I'm grateful to uh, the co-hosts um, from World Scientific uh, Press and also to uh, Professor Fung and to um, uh, Zhe Chung, um, uh, who has been a good colleague over the years, I'm really grateful uh, to your, 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 your inviting me. Um, the study or collection of documents that I uh, put together with a colleague, um, uh, Gemma Chara Dung, uh, a couple of years ago, was really inspired uh, by this interest in Europe and China and their relations and the fact that they were two parties or two entities that in fact had been talking to each other, getting to know each other, um, understanding and misunderstanding each other for a long, long time. Their relationship is not a new one. It goes back at least 400 years and arguably over 700 years to the time of uh, the great explorer Marco Polo, of course. And I was really kind of wondering what um, European perspectives over that long period uh, could, could be characterized. How could we best characterize them? In fact, really significant European figures have thought about China and Europe's relations with China for a long time and in a great deal of depth. And when I say significant figures, I mean figures who you wouldn't normally associate closely with China. You'd think of them as being mainstream intellectual figures in science, philosophy, literature, culture, and best known really for their work in that area rather than talking about China. Uh, Voltaire, the French philosopher from the Enlightenment, uh, Leibniz, also a great Enlightenment philosopher, um, Bertrand Russell, 20, 20th century philosopher, Max Weber, the father of Western sociology, modern sociology, you know, kind of uh, Carl Jung, Carl Gustav Jung, incredibly important uh, psychoanalyst. Uh, you know, these are people who are recognized um, for a body of work which is not principally associated with China. 
And yet all of the figures that I just mentioned wrote specifically about China in very important ways and in ways which I felt had been a little bit forgotten. And so I really wanted to put in one place, you know, representative key things that they had said about their understanding of Europe at the time they were writing and its relations with China. Now, obviously, the earlier you go, the more remote and the less would really be known uh, about China by European writers. Uh, Leibniz, uh, Voltaire, Montesquieu, the kind of Enlightenment figures, and I put those together in one chapter in this book and their writings on their understanding of China, um, never physically went to China. Of course, it was a huge journey then. They were dependent mostly on the work of the Jesuits, uh, Matteo Ricci, of course, the great um, kind of Sinologist and Jesuit missionary from the end of the uh, 16th and the beginning of the 17th century, uh, figures um, who came later, who published significant materials in European languages on China, which broadcast knowledge about what the Qing, the Ming, the Qing, and then more contemporary China was. Um, Duhald was a French uh, kind of scholar from the early 18th century who published a huge, long um, kind of, I think it's a three or four <coughs> volume book uh, on China. And that was enormously influential uh, amongst British writers like Adam Smith, um, David Hume, uh, you know, Samuel Johnson, the writer, and actually kind of prompted this uh, sort of period of, I suppose, <coughs> idealism about what China was for Europeans. Um, but all of that book, that monumental book, was based not on direct experience of China, but on the testimony of Jesuits who had lived, worked, and been in China before. And so overwhelmingly, until the 19th century, there wasn't really a huge amount of direct contact with China by Europeans. But mostly it was mediated by the missionaries um, the Jesuit missionaries in particular, and most of it, therefore, was in a certain framework where there was a kind of purpose for these individuals going to China and working and living there, which was really to convert, and they did to some degree convert some significant figures, but they weren't particularly mainstream or successful. And, you know, that kind of, I suppose, impacts on what they wrote and how they wrote. But certainly they had a lot of direct experience. And Mattia Ricci uniquely wrote in um, a kind of, you know, Chinese, one of the kind of books he wrote was wholly in Chinese about the, you know, kind of dialogue between uh, a Westerner and a, a Chinese scholar, uh, kind of demonstrating, in his view, the ways in which these two cultures could complement each other. I think Europe today has no real kind of sense of this story. Um, and I think it's important that we as Europeans discover that story of our engagement with China, because we are quite good at forgetting what we once knew pretty clearly. Uh, it's weird that many, many centuries ago, I mean, two or 300 years ago, we at least sort of had a sense of um, curiosity and I guess a sort of ability to use our imaginations about what China might be as a culture and what it might mean for Europeans as it came into their lives. Now, I suppose a lot of that knowledge has been internalized and normalized. And we've sort of almost forgotten the impact that as cultures, Europe and China have had on each other. And it's been really, really significant. And rediscovering that story uh, re kind of igniting that story, I think, is actually kind of, to me, extremely important, extremely significant. In the last year, I've been working on sabbatical on a kind of, um, you know, sort of follow up to this work. And that is the British story of its relations with China, again, since around about 1600. And it seems to me that it's a kind of similar pattern of actually Britain knowing an enormous amount about China, uh, but China, uh, you know, kind of not really being a, a place that contemporary British people 
feel that they you know really do understand and know much about there's a lot of misunderstanding but it's strange because clearly Britain and China have dealt with each other for a long long time I think that's because Britain does lack a narrative of its uh you know kind of story with China a narrative of its relations with China and stories are important you know they make sense and give meaning to things to me the four principal areas in which you can try and plot how Europeans, British and Chinese have dealt with each other are in these kind of um, sort of zones where I think that there have been historically imbalances, even though there's been a big attempt to create some kind of harmony. The first is in the economic realm, in the realm of you know people's well-being and the material lives that they live. Now, we know from the work of historic economists uh, that China, in terms of the gross size of its economy, at least until the early 19th century, was maybe the largest in the world. The economy of Qing China was huge. We could argue about the composition of that economy and the fact that it was mostly artisan, small, you know, kind of workshops. It wasn't industrialized at all. That was one of the great causes of problems later. But, you know, there was more of a balance and equality in terms of economic size, at least until then. But afterwards, through much of the modern period, at least until recently, economic imbalance has been largely in favour of Europeans. The second area of imbalance has been military uh, and the military kind of assets of both sides. And again, overwhelmingly through the modern period until recently, Europeans have been uh, in the beneficial position and the stronger position. This is one of the problems in the Anglo-Chinese wars in the 16, uh, sorry, in the 18, uh, 1840 and then 1858, that China's naval mili- naval technology was inferior to that of Britain. And despite enormous numerical imbalances, uh, Britain was able to enforce through violence its commercial interests and then political interests because of the use of its uh, technological advantages with its navy. The third area of imbalance is uh, that of simple culture. I mean, and here I think there's probably been more complicated story, but certainly after the initial encounter between Europeans and principally British at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, you would argue that until recently again, the cultural confidence of Europe was greater than that of China. China, through much of the modern period, went through a crisis of cultural confidence and of cultural identity and didn't really know how to assert and believe in itself and the potency of its cultural assets uh, in face of Europeans, who on the surface at least looked like they had much greater cultural kind of awareness. Uh... This um, This is obviously um, connected uh, to the issue of knowledge uh, and the kind of knowledge imbalances. And here I would argue, and again, this uh, is something that probably um, is, uh, you know, kind of maybe um, not what people might think, but really it was more common for Europeans and British to know much more about China before the 20th century, at least the later 20th century, than for Chinese to know much about those you know kind of who were from europe and britain um knowledge imbalance was huge indeed for the awareness of this place great britain britain england whatever you want to call it there's very little in chinese language material until the beginning of the 19th century or at least the mccartney ambassadorship in 1793 that kind of showed any real awareness that there was this place called britain i mean i think the Qianlong Emperor, at least up until that time, thought of Britain and Holland as the being basically the same place. Um, probably one of the most complete uh, kind of accounts of Britain as an independent place didn't happen until a couple of years after the Anglo-Chinese War in 1842. I think um, Wei, Wei Chun uh, and his book on maritime powers in, it published, I think, in 1842. So the knowledge was really are in favour of uh, the Europeans rather than the Chinese. That also, of course, has changed in recent years. And then the final area of imbalance is really about geopolitics. 
and the idea of influence and geopolitical influence. And again, you could argue that through much of the modern period, the networks, alliance systems, are, and the international um, influence and assets geopolitically of Europe have been superior to that of China, which was more isolated, certainly after the Second World War, uh, and much more kind of limited. Now, in those four areas, economic, uh, cultural knowledge, um, military, and geopolitics, the imbalances, at least as far as Europe is concerned, have shifted decisively towards China now. In terms of economics, China as a single economy is obviously larger than any single European economy. Indeed, you could argue, I mean, it's kind of, um, it's still smaller than the whole of the European area, but I mean, as a single country, it's obviously, um, there's no European country, not even Germany, that could be, uh, you know, kind of comparable to the size of the Chinese economy. In terms of uh, military, again, uh, Europe is not really uh, kind of comparable to China in terms of its uh, military assets. It's not really a security actor. That's one of Europe's problems in recent years. As NATO, of course, as part of an alliance system with the United States, maybe it's comparable, but not really, you know, kind of outside of these alliance systems. Um, in terms of culture and knowledge, I think China, China is now more confident and certainly has invested huge amounts in understanding more about Europeans uh, in ways in which Europe is constantly uh, kind of aware of its lack of real deep knowledge about China. I mean, there's always complaints of not enough people learning Chinese, knowing about China, living in China. So culture and knowledge, I think, have shifted again in China's favor. In geopolitics, and I'm happy to talk about this later, things are a little bit different. Again, I would say that, uh, you know, kind of it's maybe more equal. You wouldn't say that uh, America, as, as, uh, Europe is um, not well integrated into the global system. It's a global actor, but a more complicated one because it's not a single sovereign nation state. And you would say that China, again, is limited by some of its attitudes towards alliances because of the unequal treaties in the 19th and 20th centuries. It has a deep skepticism and resistance to treaty-based alliances but it's certainly into networks, into involvement with multilateral institutions. And so you could say in that sense that it's much more geopolitically active and therefore influential, although maybe Europe and China probably are more comparable and more balanced in this area than any of the other three areas. But I mean, still, China is significantly more powerful now than it was in recent history. So I suppose my concluding comments really to this sort of opening statement are that in view of these four areas of imbalance and the shifting nature of the relationship because of the shifting, the shift from one, one area of advantage for Europe to, to another, the fact that in areas historically where Europe did have advantages from the military to the economic to the geopolitical and the cultural and knowledge, these now no longer really stand that has obviously a massive impact on the nature of the relationship between Europe and China. But I don't see much evidence, at least in political elites in Europe, that the mindset has really caught up with this historic and fundamental change. I'm not saying that this is a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a fact that the changes that I've talked about have happened. And to use the same language as Europeans about China that we did 30 or 40 years ago is not recognizing a fundamental change in the reality that's presented to us. It is a part of European tradition to be positivist and empirical, but it's strange that in engaging with China, the European default continues to be as though we are dealing with abstract ideas and things that don't really accord with what we see with our own eyes. Until, therefore, we change the sorts of language we talk and the ways in which we understand and the frameworks within which we see China, it's not going to be easy to craft 
uh, kind of a consistent and effective policy. And just very finally to come to the issue of the United States, of course, the United States has a very distinctive and different history with China than Europe. The United States was not in the same way as Europeans and a colonizer, even as a sort of a soft imperialism. Uh, and it's not uh, necessarily involved, at least in the kind of 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, in very aggressive moves to change China. That kind of maybe happened later, but certainly not at the period of high colonization and imperialism, when really Britain and European powers were the main activists. So it's probably a misunderstanding to think that because of that history, America and Europe's position on China today is going to be completely aligned. It is obviously a different sort of position because it starts from a different place. And again, I don't see much recognition of that in contemporary policymaking and in the kind of construction of relationships with China by Europeans and Americans. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Professor Brown. This is great. Uh, I think it's such a tour de force. Uh, thank you uh, in particular for your concise and insightful historical survey of, of China-European interactions. Uh, I think some of the names you mentioned, such as uh, Matteo Ricci, uh, Voltaire, Russell, and of course Weber, are pretty fam familiar to many Chinese. I know many Chinese are you know, still fascinated by European history, culture, and society. Uh, in, in the current world of geopolitical competition, we often forget the long history of cultural, educational, and economic exchanges between Europe and China that have benefited both sides, actually. So I thank you for reminding us of the importance of exchanges and cooperation while dealing with the many imbalances uh, you mentioned in, the, in a relationship. Well, I think my, my colleagues and I have a lot of questions for you and uh, our audience may also have many uh, burning questions for you as well. So that, let's get started, you know, and I will take advantage as, of, of my role as a moderator to uh, ask you the first question. Um, my first question is about the uh, current affairs the Russia-Ukraine war. We just passed the one-year mark of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. How do Europeans view China's role in the conflict? Do Europeans believe China is taking a neutral position and playing a constructive role? What do you think of China's 12-point peace proposal? And finally, have Europeans' overall views of China changed before and after the Russian invasion? I know I've uh, bundled mm -hmm. up quite a few questions here, no. so please uh, skip one or two. Uh, thank you. Well, that, that, those are huge questions. Look, I mean, Europeans broadly are divided between their idealism and their realism. Their idealism is, you know, they kind of really want to uh, believe in values, European Enlightenment values. They like to believe that Europe is the home of those values, and they kind of want to support uh, Ukraine in its, uh, you know, fight against Russia and the Russian invasion and, and the brutality of that. Uh, you know, kind of really by believing that they, as Biden, you know, the American president said when he was in Poland, are, are kind of standing up for the ideal of democracy. And in that context, of course. China and, and its reluctance to take any real side or, or to sort of not leave the side of Russia, uh, at least sort of symbolically, um, is, is a problem for Europeans, for sure. On the other hand, though, Europeans are also realists. As I said, we're empiricists and positivists. We kind of want to believe uh, that we see the way the world as the way it is. And, you know, we kind of understand that China's a massive partner economically, because our economies are suffering at the moment uh, in terms of climate change and global warming, in terms of facing global risks um, and problems, China is unavoidable. And so its role in the Russia-Ukrainian conflict uh, is complicated by the fact that we are very divided. We're very, very divided. Um, now, uh, 
it's, I suppose, China's role in uh, the kind of Russia-Ukrainian war has sort of made things very, very complicated for how Europeans think about China in Europe. Um, because, you know, there's a group of people who obviously feel that the way that China has not agreed with NATO, has not agreed to work on Russia to cause it to, you know, end the conflict is yet more proof that it is the big enemy. And I, I mean, I completely understand that point of view, but the point is that there's a reluctance to accept that China does not think, as Europeans do, that we are the heroes. You know, I mean, uh, it thinks um, of Europeans and NATO as making many mistakes. It thinks of the adventurism in the Middle East, uh, the problems in Afghanistan as just a long record of failure. And therefore, it's very skeptical about the idea of going for, you know, kind of a victory for any party, either the Russians or the Ukrainians. I mean, the Chinese, I've heard one, um, you know, official from China characterize it as they don't believe that either side can win and they don't believe that either side should lose. They want a kind of stalemate uh, or a draw, an honorable draw. I mean, the question is, of course, is that possible? Um, that is a hard message to promote in Europe. China's 12 point um, proposal. Um, I mean, you know, China has spoken now, the proposal is being looked at and considered, but I think most people feel that it's passivism, you know, it's it's sort of passivity dressed up as something that looks a bit more active. Um, I would also say that China's passivity is a big, big problem for Europeans. We are believers in action, you know, we love the idea of teleology and actions and, you know, kind of um, outputs and, you know, the idea that you're making a difference. I mean, and governments all have to be sort of very action orientated. And I think Chinese power with its sort of um, defensiveness, sometimes it's sort of reluctance to kind of step forward, and even where areas where you expect it to speak, it's passivity. As one um, French sinologist philosopher, um, Francois Julien said some years ago, you know, China is a power that haunts because it doesn't act. This, this really kind of causes huge problems for European policymakers um, because Russia and Ukraine are very direct issues. So I would say uh, the um, big problem for um, you know, China's role in Russia, Ukraine from the beginning has been that its passivity has made people assume the worst in Europe. Um, and so far, I don't think that they've got real final evidence of that. But I don't think that they are going to be able to embrace a China which sort of is assumed to have influence with Russia, but is still unwilling to really do something. Uh, and I think Europeans probably won't accept uh, what I guess should be accepted, which is that Russia certainly is not supportive of maybe Putin and what he's doing. I mean, completely supportive, but it's definitely not an ally of NATO and the West. It doesn't really um, fully support either position. It's looking after its own self-interest. Thank you, Professor Baram. I think you clearly explained the dilemma <laughs> cases. Uh, obviously, we hope that China will be uh, more uh, active, you know, in mediating between Russia and Ukraine. But I guess, you know, in some areas, perhaps China should not be too <laughs> active, you know, perhaps in the, for example, in the Taiwan Strait, right? So I do have a follow-up question, actually. Uh, this is related to the Ukraine uh, crisis, because some people like to say that, you know, Ukraine today, Taiwan tomorrow, right, to highlight uh, the potential danger Taiwan faces from the People's Republic of China. To what extent do you think uh, Ukraine and Taiwan similar or different? Do you think that Beijing has a timetable to unify with, with Taiwan? Thank you. Well, um, I... Um, I don't think that they're that similar. I mean, beyond the assertion of, you know, kind of uh, control of sovereignty by one you know, entity over another. Yeah, I mean, that that's maybe similar. But, you know, Taiwan is um, a very different case because it's an island, because it's a you know, direct ally of the United States, because it's you know, much harder to see how any military conflict between Russia, uh, China and Taiwan would not end up being a complete and total catastrophe. I mean, the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict has already had a massive impact on 
you know, the, the world sort of economy, and, and it's been very negative. Um, but it would be nothing compared to China attacking Taiwan militarily. I mean, that would smash apart most of the world's key supply lines. It would be a vast catastrophe for semiconductors, as we all know now. I mean, you know, the role of the Taiwan Semiconductor Corporation is, is just key. And that's, you know, what 85% of the world's, you know, high quality semiconductors. Beyond that, it would be literally bringing uh, America and the United uh, America and China in direct conflict with each other. So uh, there is no good for anyone from a conflict of that kind between China and Amer uh, 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 Taiwan. Uh, I mean, however, we also have to recognize, as your question alludes to, you know, the enormous importance for Chinese nationalism, which is very potent uh, in Chinese domestic politics under Xi Jinping, of, of this issue. Uh, and you should never underestimate the power emotionally of, of this issue. I mean, it's the great unifier, just as, you know, kind of there may be issues uh, in any domestic politics in America or Europe where people, you know, they disagree on everything else, but they agree on, you know, this one thing. I mean, in America at the moment, it seems to be regarding China as a huge problem and a kind of competitor and a threat. Um, you know, whether you're Republican or Democrat, that's that's where you're going to kind of be coming from. Um, in, in Europe, you know, there are probably similar kind of points that really bring people together. So I don't think um, we can uh, be complacent and lazy about this issue, but I'm pretty sure that Chinese policymakers are very aware of the danger of, you know, kind of overstepping or being adventurous, but they will not relinquish their demand on, on you know, kind of Taiwan and the sovereignty of Taiwan. Um, the final issue is that it's much more difficult because Taiwanese identity is so strong now. I mean, it's, it's you know, Taiwanese have no memory of what it was like not to be de facto independent. I mean, that's what in a sense they are. And the uh, kind of strength of Taiwanese identity means that whatever Beijing does, it is going to be dealing with 23 million people who do not recognize themselves as straightforwardly Chinese. They think of themselves as Taiwanese Chinese. And that's an enormous, I mean, I suspect that that's going to be the much more difficult issue in the end, um, how Beijing um, achieves what it wants to with, you know, a population that has a much more complicated idea of who they are. Um, I mean, that's, to me, I don't really know how you resolve that. And it's best not to try and resolve it for as long as you don't have a clear path out of that issue. Uh, to me, it's going to be a long, long time. Well, thank you very much. I, I guess we all hope that there will be no war in the Taiwan Strait. I, I, I think that all parties involved should work together to uh, achieve that objective. Um, I think next, uh, my colleague, Professor Fong, uh, will ask you some questions. Professor Fong, please. You're, uh, unmute yourself, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Kerry, for uh, for reminding me the long interaction between Europe and China. Uh, I have to tell you a, a very a one minute story. Uh, I was in Macau, and that's where I learned about Makil Ricky. In fact, he is so he was so he is so revered. There are schools that's named after him. His Chinese name is Li Ma Dou. I'm sure you mm -hmm. know. And uh, I have actually given uh, speeches to the Li Ma Dou high school students. And uh, I was also very disturbed that uh, because University of Macau's unwillingness to give some rooms to store some of Li Ma Dou's uh, writings uh, that Macau had. That, uh, in, uh, that a few years ago, we had this huge typhoon and those documents were destroyed. Uh, mm. It was really, really sad. Mm. So anyway, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, reminding us this important history. And, and what tells me is that history is something that we need to always keep in mind in dealing with China or any other issue in the world. Uh, unfortunately, with the United States having only 200 some years of history, 
it is very difficult for the Americans to always bring in history as a perspective. I hope that Britain would be one that has, you know, after all your Cambridge University is a thousand years old, um, <laughs> you could, uh, you could uh, help the Americans to think along those lines. Let me bring it to something more current. Uh, one of the clearly the most distinguished investigators of the US reporters is Seymour Hirsch. And uh, he wrote an article recently dealing about the possibility of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline explosions and was carried out according to what he wrote uh, by the United States. While we can understand, but probably not accept the rationality why the American media largely or totally ignored it. Uh, we are puzzled why the European media also seems to have been silent on this issue and that the European leaders are not pushing for the, for the understanding of the outcome of this uh, investigation. For example, Sweden, who did some investigation, I was told, but refused to release the uh, outcome. From a geopolitical point of view, why is that? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I, I appreciate you, your story about uh, 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 the kind of Matteo Ricci, the uh, kind of Matteo Ricci, the, um, uh, yeah, I mean, he's an enormously important figure. We should think about him more. Very inspiring figure. Um, look, I mean, I think for Europeans, we are very conflicted. And I don't know specifically what the reason for not wanting to investigate, uh, you know, this accident or incident more deeply. But it is pretty clear that as a, you know, kind of security actor, Europe is really, really um, closely allied with America. And, you know, we see this in many other places where people, Australia, for instance, or, um, um, you know, many in the Asia Pacific region, they're torn between their security interests being with America, but their economic interests being with China. Um, and, you know, so Europe isn't alone in this, but Europe is such a big economic actor, and yet it doesn't really have a security you know, it, 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 what is it as a security actor? I mean, it's, it, yeah, the French have obviously kind of significant assets, the British, the, you know, the Germans up to a point, but under Chancellor Schultz, they're probably going to be even more kind of active as, as security actors. But, you know, the, that's individual countries. It's not Europe as a whole. There isn't a pan-European security concept, I don't think. So Anything which questions our allegiance or our links with, uh, with America is, is, is very, very difficult, very sensitive. Um, and so I think we would probably be resistant to exploring things that might, uh, you know, kind of undermine our belief that we are very closely allied with America. Um, Donald Trump's presidency was unsettling and difficult for Europeans because it was possible that he would walk away from NATO. And this was really a scary thing for Europeans. And I think under Biden, that's different. He's obviously more committed. But we do know that it just takes one election for everything to change. And one of the problems for Europe, the, one of the strange things for Europeans today is that in some ways, China is much more predictable under Xi Jinping. And America is really unpredictable. And this is a complete reverse. I mean, in the past, we would have said America, totally predictable. China, we don't know what's going to happen next. But now that's changed. And I think actually we have to remember that Xi Jinping is a leader for all of the um, issues and, and problems and challenges. Well, we've definitely got predictability. We kind of know what we're dealing with, even if we're not happy about it. With America, we live in a much more um, unstable position, and the implications of that are very profound. And I suspect, therefore, that there will be many kind of similar incidences where Europeans will want, not want to ask too much and question too much because they will be quite frightened of the potential answers they get. Um, we really want to believe that America is committed to Europe, 
I think at the moment America is committed to Europe, but I don't know what's going to happen even in two years' time. Um, and in the further future, well, who knows? It's really, really uncertain. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Professor Pei will ask the next question, right? Please go ahead. Yes, um, Professor Brown, thank you for this very insightful view from Europe. Uh, as you comment, um, I think more ways than one, the British is more aligned with the US policy. And uh, so that put the Britain in a very unique position. So I think there's several questions here. What is the Britain's view of the America's one China policy? Do you have different view from what Americans see? And um, how do you view the visit to Taiwan by members of British Parliament and lawmakers uh, from either from Europe or from other European countries? And um, what do you expect Beijing's response might be if the US House Speaker Calvin McCarthy visit Taiwan in near future? Yeah, look, on the one China policy, it's interesting. I was looking at um, the Foreign and Commonwealth um, Archives, so sorry, the Foreign Office Archives, uh, from when Edward Heath, the British Prime Minister, visited China in 1974. In fact, at that time, Edward Heath was not the Prime Minister. He just lost office uh, to uh, uh, Harold Wilson. Um, but he was recognised in Beijing as the person who had um, normalized relations and upgraded relations with China to ambassador level uh, in 1970, I think 72, after the Nixon visit. And so he was really kind of appreciated in Beijing. And indeed, he got to meet Mao Zedong. Uh, he got to meet um, Zhou Enlai. I mean, he, he got to meet Deng Xiaoping. Apparently, at the dinner that Deng Xiaoping gave to Heath uh, in the Great Hall of the People, um, there was a big problem because Deng Xiaoping had said, he appreciated Britain supporting the one China policy and recognizing um, that China had sovereignty over Taiwan. <laughs> However, the big problem was, of course, that isn't and wasn't the British position. The British position is that we acknowledge China um, believing it has sovereignty over Taiwan. We acknowledge which of course is impossible to really work out what, what we really think, but it, we just acknowledge China's position. We don't say if it's right or wrong. I mean, I mean, this is like someone saying, Kerry, we think you're a complete idiot. And I acknowledge that, but I don't say if I think they're right or wrong. I mean, it's, um, it's sort of the, the problem, I suppose, of the one China policy is that everyone who has a one China policy, whether it's America, Britain, Australia, I mean, they're all different. I mean, they all have slightly different kind of uh, ways of saying. The main thing, though, is that everyone has these policies. And I suppose the issue is if America does say that it doesn't stand by the one China policy, um, then, then we have a problem. Um, you know, because and, and they, I know at the moment that's unlikely, but there may be American politicians in the future who do think we, we don't need this policy. It makes no sense. The Shanghai communique you know, we, we don't understand what this was about and we don't really care and we're going to have, you know, separate relations. And, and that's when we have a big, big problem because it certainly matters to Beijing. Um, so to come to your second point about if the Speaker of the House of Congress does go to China, uh, to uh, Taiwan, yeah, I mean, that's going to be a huge problem. It's not going to be a triggering problem. I mean, that's, I mean, that's really if in 2024 in your elections, you know, a candidate may stand who does want to walk away from that one China policy. And then we're into completely new territory, at least with uh, a speaker visiting Taiwan. There are precedents. There's a couple of precedents, one very recent. But it certainly will uh, build up more tensions and create more problems. Um, I understand in domestic politics in America, it's one of the things that really unifies people to be tougher on China, to stand against China. I mean, yeah, that's a new reality. But I mean, we have to be aware of the consequences to 
uh, Chinese, you know, in Beijing, um, this is the most sensitive area of their foreign policy. Well, it's the most sensitive area of their domestic policy, despite the fact that the outside world thinks it's part of foreign policy. You know, this is a huge, huge kind of problem. So I would always tell politicians who look at this to be aware of the big consequences, the massive consequences if they don't, um, if they're not careful. And it's very easy to see misunderstandings causing escalation, which would be a disaster, which would be a complete disaster. Well, I think that um, the current in Taiwan before the current administration took office, at that time when the Manjo was the president of Taiwan at that time, th there was really going well between China and Taiwan at that time. So I think in the past few years, the whole thing is really spiraled down in more ways than one. So in your view, who provoked the situation to make the situation much worse? Well, I'm an academic, so I'll never, I'll never say one side or the other is right or wrong. I'll just uh, <laughs> kind of, you know, I think everything has changed. The European situation since Ma Yingzhou was elected in 2008 is uh, we had a huge impact from the financial crisis and a massive impact then from Brexit and other issues and crises. I mean, Europe has been in almost a constant crisis for some of, you know, about half the period you're talking about. And that's changed us. I mean, we are lacking in confidence now. We are very nervous. You know, I think the whole atmosphere in Europe is definitely different to the way it was before 2008. <laughs> I think China's changed. Um, it's obviously become more confident in some ways, uh, more exposed. Its global role and its global reach are much, much greater. It's now a different kind of actor. Um, America has changed, of course, um, again, because of the economic crisis and then maybe the rise of populism. I mean, you know, the culture wars, all sorts of things have changed. And Taiwan sits at the heart of that as a kind of innocent. You know, I mean, in a sense, it's it's not you know, it's nothing to do with European domestic politics, American domestic politics. It's something to do with Chinese domestic politics, for sure. But it is such an important symbolic issue. Its symbolism is so important. Now, you talk about the uh, KMT, Ma Yingzhou, and, you know, um, could there maybe be um, some change with the Taiwanese election uh, next year? You know, it's possible that the Guomindan will come back. Uh, you know, I mean, they have quite... Um, they're in a better position now than they were a couple of years ago. Saying when has to step down, um, you know, there's a possibility that there might be a, a kind of more conciliatory policy. But I think Taiwanese public opinion has changed too. So it's not going to be easy to return to where things were. I guess we're going to look back historically on the Hu Jintao period with a bit of nostalgia because the world was slightly simpler then. I think now it's much harder to get compromise and build a common ground. Um, my personal belief is the biggest problems facing the world are not going to be that between Taiwan and China and these geopolitical issues. They're going to be confronting global warming. And the weird thing there is that China probably has a common understanding that this is a serious issue and it's maybe not doing enough, but it's doing something. Um, whereas, of course, politically in Europe and America, there's less of a consensus, still less of a consensus. And, you know, there's going to be greater problems in trying to support combating climate change because divisions in public opinion in Europe and America, which are getting deeper. Thank you. Thank you. Well, certainly Taiwan is a very contentious issue between China and uh, Western countries, you know. But I think, uh, Professor Brown, as you pointed out, you know, there are many other issues where you know China and other countries can cooperate. So let's mm. turn to the uh, China policy overall. Um, you know, the United States uh, considers China as the only power that has the intention and capability to challenge the U.S. dominance in the world today. Meanwhile, uh, China has been described as a systemic challenge by, by NATO. So can you help us understand how European countries' China po approach, China policy, uh, converge or diverge with America's China po policy. You know, uh, U.S. Congress uh, 
established this China Select Committee, which uh, just had its first hearing yesterday. And interestingly, the uh, hearing was interrupted at the beginning by some protesters saying that uh, China is not our enemy. So uh, do you think European countries uh, would do the same thing in terms of uh, setting up a, a, a China committee in their parliaments? Because I know that the, some people here in the United States even, you know, are concerned that we may be reintroducing McCarthyism in our politics, you know. Um, as part of the transatlantic alliance, how, how much autonomy do you think European countries have in their foreign policies regarding China? Thank yeah, you. I mean, because I'm researching history at the moment, I'm going to be rather boring and, and start by saying in 1896, I think, uh, the Marquis of Salisbury, I think, said British policy towards China was a mystery that was unfathomable to any human being. Now, that's a problem because he was the person who was in charge of that policy. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so um, I don't think it's changed. What, what, is, what is policy towards China? I mean, European policy towards China, British policy towards China um, is, is a bit of a mystery. I think there are two issues, um, and they're not about policy as a um, an instrument, you know, a way of getting things done. Um, they're just about what policy is built on, where it actually has to come from, what has to has to exist in the infrastructure before you have policy. The first is in Europe, we don't have consensus on what kind of a problem China is to us. We just know it's a problem. On the one hand, you have people who believe it's an existential problem. They believe that China is a threat to European values, way of life. It is aggressive. It's trying to change us. But there's others, and I'm in that group, who don't see that. We think China is a problem because it, not of what it does, but what it doesn't do. China is a very reluctant global actor. It is self-interested. It probably wants to kind of not be involved in things that don't have direct impact. It doesn't want to be a new United States. Its problem is not that China wants to come and change us. I believe the problem is that China doesn't want to actively have anything to do with this unless it has to. So <laughs> this is a very, very different view. And there's no consensus at the moment. Uh, all I can say is that Europeans, maybe like Americans, are probably panicking a bit and don't know because they haven't worked out what consensus should be until someone actually creates consensus on that core issue of what kind of problem China is. Well, then we can't really have a coherent policy. We have a tripartite policy, which we have at the moment, where one day we say China is a competitor, the next day we say it's a collaborator, and the third way we say it's an enemy. I mean, this is very incoherent. The second thing, uh, which is much deeper and will take a huge amount of effort to um, kind of sort out, which is why I'm working on this history stuff, is we don't know who we are. We don't know who are, you know, what are our values? We say we have values, but our actions don't really fulfill those values. Have we fulfilled our values in what, you know, Europeans have done um, even in recent history in the Middle East or Afghanistan or elsewhere, I mean, you know, we we speak one way and we act another. One day we're talking about economic benefits from China. The next day we're yelling at them about their values. You know, we're very incoherent. I think we drive, you know, Chinese crazy. Um, and in, in a way, it's probably saved us because I suspect Chinese leaders probably think, well, we can't be as crazy as we look. Maybe, you know, we're kind of there's something we're doing that's very kind of Machiavellian and complicated. We're just trying to put on this show of being divided. But the problem is, I think we are really divided. And um, we have to work out who we are. And part of that is to work out how much we have been made by others. But part is also to recognize how much we have contributed to others. Why I look at Chinese European and Chinese British history is we would not be the people we are without the engagement with China. We wouldn't have our national drink, tea, without our engagement with China. We wouldn't be eating from porcelain without our engagement with China. We wouldn't be, you know, kind of having 
much of the sort of daily life that we have today without manufacturers from China. We wouldn't really, you know, I mean, the whole kind of thing is a sort of, um, you know, kind of an attempt to sort of pretend that we don't um, make each other the way we are. But as much as Europeans have contributed to China, particularly in the last few decades, China has definitely contributed to Europe. And I think we need to recognize that, but also to recognize uh, that our, you know, kind of fundamental values have to be pluralistic. And if they're pluralistic, I think we have to deal with a partner globally like China that does not have the same worldview as us. We should be able to do that. As Enlightenment powers, we should be able to handle that. And I'm surprised at the moment we don't seem to be able to handle that, but we've got to. If we can have those two things in place, which are very difficult, to know better who we are, but also to have a consensus on what we think China is to us, we can create policy. But without those, we will do part-time policy that will be replaced one day by something the next day, and it will be very short-term, it will be reactive. The weird thing is at the moment that both Amer all of uh, like America, Europe, and China are playing a sort of offensively defensive game. We're like kind of two teams in a football match who are trying to stop the other side get to their goals. We're kind of just defending all the time. And everyone knows how boring a soccer match is when all you do is defend and you don't attack. You know, you don't actually positively go and do stuff. You're always kind of protecting. Um, and I think that that's what we have at the moment. Um, maybe it's kind of going to be permanent or maybe it's something that we'll move beyond. But at the moment, we are fairly similar in a strange way in our offensive defensiveness. Thanks. Well, indeed. Yeah, thank you. Indeed, you know, uh, the lack of consensus and uh, and um, uh, inconsistency apparently are some of the issues uh, in the collective approach to China in Europe as as well as in the United States, I guess. Uh, looks like we still have time for one more question, a second round of question from uh, uh, Professor Fern and Professor Pei, each of you. Uh, then uh, we can turn to the audience question. So uh, Professor Fern and Professor uh, Pei, please ask uh, one more question, each of you. Professor Fern first. Uh, Stephen, go ahead. Okay. Um, if a hypothetical war happened in Taiwan Strait, what do you think the European Union countries would do? And how might Great Britain respond to the war differently from the other major European countries? Um, I mean, I think Europe would do as much as we can to pre prevent a, a conflict stick sort of breaking out. Ultimately, though, we're security allies of the United States. Um, that's that's just, you know, that's that's a statement of fact. But I mean, I don't know how. I mean, I, it's just I don't really think about this happening because it's just so horrible to imagine it happening. I don't know what the world would look like if. You know, China were to launch an invasion and then, uh, you know, America would be dra dragged in and maybe Europe. I, I don't know what that world would look like because I'm too terrified to think about it. Um, but but the fact is that historically uh, and today, uh, you know, Europeans are security allies of the United States through NATO, for all sorts of other interactions. So there's no scenario I can think of where Europe would not be either a passive or an active supporter of what you, what America needs to do. Um, and I think making that clear uh, to China is important because, you know, we don't want misunderstanding. If there were to be a move to try and resolve the issue with Taiwan um, in ways which did not have consensus and harmony, we would be looking at massive consequences. And I think that's really important to constantly stress. Uh, this is an issue which is best left to just deal with itself. And maybe one day it will, but obviously at the moment it's too difficult. But it's very strange that we observe from the US. I cannot find any statement by any of the Chinese leadership stating that uh, they will evade Taiwan, 
I think the only statement they made is that they will not give up their option. Yeah. No, I the last agree. resort. But on no, the other hand, yeah. our government is publicizing agenda schedules all the time. Set the time invasion will happen in 2025, 2026, 2027. No, I completely, I completely agree. Yeah, and no, I completely agree. I mean, um, I am sure in Beijing, they absolutely understand the, the things we've been talking about and that their um, preferred option is definitely not, not this one. I mean, they know how hard this is. And surely the Russia-Ukraine war has shown that war is totally unpredictable. You never know what direction it's going to go in. So uh, like Clausewitz said, you know, in his great work on war, you know, it speeds up events and it speeds up responses and you lose control. And I think in Beijing, uh, the leadership want control. I think you're also right that politicians outside of China need to be um, aware of, uh, you know, kind of not adding to the problems. I mean, they need to accept that the Taiwan-China issue is a very complicated one, but not to try and make it worse by, you know, talking about, yeah, these deadlines to invasion and stuff, because sometimes you, you know, you create these things just by talking about them. I, I have one last question before we go to the next phase. Uh, this is a history, since you wrote a, such a magnificent book uh, regarding uh, Europe and, and China. You know, the British, when they, assumed, uh, when they assembled one of the most powerful navies in the world, uh, went around the world and basically conquered it. And one of the major conquering that they did was to conquer India. And that they held on to India for almost four or 500 years. Why did the British with this uh, East Indian company did not conquer China and took over China? This is a huge question for historians. As far as I can understand, it's because they didn't want the responsibility. They wanted from much of the late Qing, so from the Second Anglo-Chinese War of 1858, uh, sorry, 1856, 1860. I mean, they really wanted um, commercial opportunity from China, a China that worked for them, but where they didn't have the responsibility of governing it. They didn't want a second India. I mean, they felt that India had been nothing but a drain on the government, a problem. You know, the government had to step in when the East India Company really stopped functioning. Um, and so I think the British government under Gladstone in particular was definitely not keen on responsibilities. Um, and in, as you know, uh, in the Taiping Rebellion, despite initially in 1851 supporting the Taiping, you know, and being interested in rebellion uh, government, by 1864, uh, the British were fighting on behalf of the Qing and the Manchu, you know, the Manchurians to kind of the, 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 the um, yeah, the Manchurian uh, kind of dynasty to sort of um, preserve the dynasty because they wanted that to stay in place. And they were very ambiguous when the dynasty fell in 1911 after the Xinhai revolution. We certainly didn't like Sun Yat-sen. Uh, we thought that he was an imposter and a kind of, you know, uh, mm. a bit of a crazy guy. We kind of, to be honest, Britain has also had a really hard history of dealing with and understanding Chinese nationalism for 100 years, not, not recently, 100 years. Chinese nationalism has always been a problem for Britain. And of course, today we see that nationalism in a very different form. And I think that's one of the issues that we've never been comfortable with Chinese nationalism. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, looks like we already have quite a few questions in the, in the chat room and the audience, uh, if you wish to ask questions directly, you can also raise your hand and uh, we'll be happy to uh, uh, let you ask questions directly. Um, Andrea, could you please uh, choose and read some of the questions from the, the chat room and so that Professor Brown can, uh, can take care of them? Yes, thank you. Of course. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for the wonderful presentation and the uh, answer of questions. Um, we have now come to the Q&A session. Um, thank you to all of you who have posted the questions in the chat. 
I'll be reading out some of them, but again, if you'd like to unmute and ask your questions directly to the speakers, please raise your hand via Zoom now and we'll invite you to speak. Otherwise, I am happy to read them. Um, okay, so the first question from Stephen. In looking at public opinion surveys of Europeans' views of China, there has been a noticeable decline in positive attitudes, though with at least one exception, Greece. What might explain this outlier? Well, Greece has a very, uh, quite a successful um, investment from Costco, the Ch Chinese Ocean and Shipping Company in the Piraeus, Piraeus port, which has created, uh, you know, kind of jobs and it's been relatively successful. Um, my colleague, Leia Camino, is, is, is here. I mean, you probably, you're based in Greece. I know you, you could probably answer this question. I mean, do you have any ideas about this? Well, hello, everyone. Um, definitely, I have just finished a, a paper that hopefully uh, the, the Lao China Institute will be publishing uh, very soon. Um, indeed, Greece is an outlier. Um, there has been uh, pockets of, of more negative attitudes um, in periods, uh, especially where there was a transition and there were more there was more um, labor issues that Costco had to deal with. There was a period of adjustment. But since then, um, the political climate is quite favorable to Greece, and when Greece was immersed in in the in the financial uh, crisis, uh, China was a source of of economic uh, opportunities and and prosperity. So this has translated also in a, a more favorable view from from the society as well. Uh, but but I think that the main explanation is what Professor Brown mentioned of of uh, a successful case study in in, in Piraeus. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Leia. Thank you. Uh, next question from Halil. Could Mr. Brown further expand on the US-Europe alignment on China issue? Um, so in terms of the um, coordination, uh, the US and Europe, I mean, they, I mean, I think they do have a dialogue on China now, maybe of a more formal dialogue. Um, the main alignment, though, I think, is that in the uh, European, the European Commission produced a paper in 2019, a sort of strategy paper, which was broadly, um, you know, about China being a mixture of a competitor, collaborator, collaborator and adversary. And uh, the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, echoed that um, position uh, in a speech he made a few weeks later. Um, and so I think there's, or no, not actually made it, he made it a year, a year later. I mean, after being elected, uh, Biden was elected. Um, I mean, I think both sides have this tripartite division, you know, why, and, and so does Britain in a thing called the Integrated Review from um, a couple of years ago. So we have this sort of tripartite division and that gives a sort of superficial unity. Um, the problem is underneath that there's, you know, huge differences between where you think China is a collaborator, where you think it's a competitor, where you think it's an adversary. And there probably there isn't alignment, but broadly uh, Europe and China accept, uh, sorry, Europe and America accept the same framework. It's a question of degree. Um, and in Europe, you would have to say that there's big differences. I mean, uh, probably less than there were before. China is regarded as much more of a problem now than it was before. But I mean, Germany, traditionally has been much more um, transactional, much more kind of interested in, uh, you know, commercial relations with China, not really talked much about values, uh, whereas France has been much keener about values. That, again, is an historic issue. Um, France, in the middle of the 19th century, was much more keen to promote missionary activity in China. Britain was always extremely reluctant until quite late, and one of the things I'm reading about at the moment is how negatively British consular officials regarded missionaries in China in the late 19th century, and also how sceptical British officials were of business people and their dreams of making money in China. And I think British official scepticism has continued. Uh, our position on China is similar to the Japanese position. We are appreciative of some of the things that China represents, but skeptical, constantly skeptical. And a skeptical policy, I think, is not a bad thing. <laughs> uh, Thank you. May I 
invite my friend Han Shi To, who is a uh, political writer in Hong Kong, but in fact a Singaporean in disguise, uh, to ask a question. Han, are you still there? Uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. To, are you still there? Okay, well. Anyone else uh, who wants to ask a question, please raise your hand. Okay, I think we can move to the next question then. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, he, he comes on now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. To? Uh, no questions at the moment, thank you. Oh, okay, all right. Okay. Um, Sunny asks, has China changed in a way that makes Hong Kong more like mainland politically, socially, and integrate with the mainland economically? If so, was Britain failing to understand China's changing policy and mindset on Hong Kong, which was a former colony exhibiting British and European core values, aka civil liberties? Was Britain failing to protect European values on Hong Kong? Yeah, a huge question. So when we did the, uh, you know, kind of retrocession of Hong Kong, finally in 1997, and, and all of the kind of build up to that. I don't think anyone who was involved in that process really kind of thought that China would be the way it is today in, in terms of its power. I mean, we didn't think it would develop so quickly. We didn't think its economy would grow so fast. So, I mean, a lot of the agreement was sort of maybe on the basis of, um, you know, maybe China not being as powerful as it ended up being today. Um, so I think that's caused a big imbalance. Um, and basically, um, the as far as I understand, the other big change, of course, is, you know, kind of big cultural change in Hong Kong. Many more people from outside of Hong Kong have moved in. Many of the international community maybe have moved away. So it's become much more of a sort of, you know, kind of a Chinese um, rather than an international hub. Um, and of course, that's had an impact. Um, Britain's obligations. Well, you could argue the great debate in the 1990s between Chris Patton, the final governor of Hong Kong, who I, I met the other day at an event, um, <clears throat> and then Percy Craddock, who was the chief sort of foreign office, you know, kind of architect of the um, uh, kind of agreement, was a clash between political idealist and, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a kind of, I, I suppose what you call a kind of administrative pragmatist. I mean, Chris Patton is a political idealist who believes in the noble kind of, you know, principles of democracy, whatever you might think about that. I mean, he's sincere in that. Um, whereas you've got, you know, Craddock who believed that we didn't have much scope to negotiate. We just had to kind of get whatever deal we could. And the deal we got in the end was at least, you know, preserve some things. But it preserved those things because the Chinese government in Beijing wanted to preserve them, rule of law, you know, kind of stable economic environment. Um, it really wasn't likely that Beijing would feel beholden to Britain after the, you know, kind of handover happened. And I think that's proved to be the case. Um, I'm not really uh, someone who follows Hong Kong politics closely. I know in recent years, the uh, disappointment and anger at the way that Hong Kong has been dealt with. Um, particularly under the kind of um, national security law um, from, <clears throat> I think, 2019 or earlier. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's obviously been a big, big problem. But in the mindset of Beijing, <clears throat> I think that their belief, their conviction now is that this is a completely domestic issue and they have not um, responded with anything but criticism to um, any kind of comments that Britain has made or others about the situation in Hong Kong. They think it's a domestic issue. That makes it very difficult for British and others to speak about this issue, um, even when they think they should and they have the grounds to. Okay, thank you. Um, JJ says policies vis-a-vis -vis China are often these days, these days centered around concerns over human rights. Should we overlook China's clampdowns on Uyghurs, Tibetans, Mongolians, and Hong Kongers and maintain business as usual? Or should we condition our trade and dealings with China on changes in its human rights landscape? Well, I, I mean, that's uh, kind of going back to the point I talked earlier about having consensus. If we feel the most important thing as Europeans, British, Americans in dealing with China is, is values, uh, 
then for sure, uh, these issues are hugely problematic and there have to be consequences. If, however, we believe that there's an importance in more mundane things, maybe like commercial trade, you know, kind of looking after our own prosperity materially, we have to be pragmatic. With China today, you can't be both. I mean, you can't be the idealist and the pragmatist. You have to be one or the other. You can't sit on the fence. So if you want to really say values are most important, you have to do one thing. If you want to uh, continue doing your uh, business and trade, then you kind of have to adopt another tactic. Uh, you, you know, you, you can't um, tell China, we'll do business with you, but we're going to yell at you about your values because it's clearly, it rejects that. Um, and the problem is, I looked at the latest trade statistics for at least last year, in every area, they're up. You know, I mean, the trade is going through the roof with America, with Europe. I mean, it's the biggest it's ever been. So, uh, you know, for all the talk, uh, which I, I can completely understand people's frustration and anger at the human rights issues in China. Yeah, I understand. Uh, and human rights issues everywhere, everywhere, you know, in a lot of other places. But I mean, our actions, once more, are we continue doing the trade. Um, and therefore, we've kind of chosen to say one thing and do another. Um, and there will be, if we do want to put a priority on values, there will be consequences that we have to make, sacrifices we have to make. We can't do both. Increasingly, we can't do both. That's politically hard to say, but I think that's the reality of the situation we're in. I think I have to go to another meeting in about two minutes, but I'm happy to maybe, you know, kind of take final comments or uh, anything that you have to say, that would be good to hear your views. I suggest that Zhu, uh, you make a summary comment of today's meeting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Carrie, uh, this is such an inspiring uh, dialogue. You know, really want to thank you so much for offering your brilliant comments on some of the critical issues we face today, especially <laughs> Europe's approach to China from the historical uh, perspective. I think your your views, your perspectives definitely enrich uh, the dialogue and conversation in Europe, in the United States and elsewhere about how to deal with China's rise judiciously. So I want to thank you once again for your insightful comments. And uh, this concludes our forum today. May, may, I, may I say one sentence? Yep. Uh, yeah. Today's, today's uh, dialogue is clearly coming from a Western intellect who is able to comprehend deeply the Chinese history and ways and means. I am afraid that I do not see that there is, I'm sticking my neck out here. I do not see anyone, any intellect other than perhaps, perhaps Professor Zhu in the United States that can give the same kind of open-minded, deep philosophical and historical comments about China and the world of the 21st century. I really want to thank Professor Brown or Kerry, if, I, if you don't mind me calling mm. you by your first name, that uh, it is so an, an enlightening uh, discussion today. I hope that people in the world will need to listen to this and our report, our recording will go out to the world. Thank you. Thank you for those very gracious comments. It's been wonderful to meet you and it's been great to talk to you and also to hear your deep perspectives and your long engagement with this issue. Uh, I'm, you know, I think you're very right. We have to contribute what we can. Um, the best is that we have a world of more balance and understanding even with our differences uh, and I think that's the world that we should be aiming for. So thank you very much. Very, very uh, grateful to talk to you. And so uh, I hope that, you know, we can talk in the future. Thank you very much. Thank Goodbye. you very much. Bye-bye.